welcoming and celebrating uh, your birth again. And um, God, I just pray that uh, you would fill this place and um, you would just cover our time here. Amen. Christmas to you. It is great to see so many of you out here today. Fun to see faces of family and friends and relatives here that haven't seen in a while. And uh, love, love, love being with you today. I hope that you're excited about Christmas. How many kids here are excited about Christmas Eve today? All right. How many kids are excited about Christmas Day? Uh, How many kids get to open gifts on Christmas Eve? If that's you, stand up for me. Okay. If you're a kid and your family does gifts on Christmas Eve, would you stand up? A couple of you. All right. Right now, all the rest of the kids are thinking that those parents are the coolest parents in town, all right? And how many are Christmas Day openers? If that's you, stand up for me. How many Christmas Day people, all right? Wonderful. All right, and Jerry, our biggest kid, (coughs) stood up to let me know that, so thank you. You know, I was probably 13 or 14 years old when it happened. I call it the Christmas of my discontent. My parents were incredible parents when it came to gifts. They knew how to buy their kids gifts. I am the middle of five children. I have four brothers, and when my youngest brother was 10, my sister came along, so she was maybe two or three years old at the time that uh, this event happened in my life. I used to love hanging out with my mom the night before Christmas because she was a last-minute wrapper of gifts. She bought them well ahead of time, but every year it was Christmas Eve night that she'd stay up till about 2 o'clock in the morning wrapping the gifts, and then the tree would fill up with these presents for the Schulenberg boys, and I loved getting to see what my brothers were going to get at Christmas time and kind of knowing and having the inside scoop on what their gifts were going to be. And I loved shopping with my dad at Christmas. I loved to watch him buy the same gifts over and over for my mom every year and think that somehow he was going to surprise her with the uh, bath lotion or the uh, perfume that he had bought her for the 12th time in a row. Um, But it was special and he did it because he loved her and it was traditions and he cared about her. And as much as I enjoyed watching my parents purchase and wrap presents, I really enjoyed receiving gifts. Uh, I probably had an issue as a teenager where I was a little bit selfish and certainly at 13 or 14 years old had become very selfish because on that Christmas, I don't remember what the gifts were. I'm sure they were completely fine. They were probably wonderful gifts, but for whatever reason, I wasn't content with the gifts I'd received. In fact, I was a little bit ticked off at my brothers because I thought I had given them better gifts than they had given me. And and I I actually threw a hissy fit on that uh, 13th or 14th Christmas of my life. I slammed doors. I ran to my room. I cried. I made a general fool out of myself because I wasn't content with the Christmas gifts that I had received. Somehow they didn't meet my expectations. They weren't fun enough or they weren't uh, cool enough or whatever else. And I had become so spoiled and lost the true meaning of Christmas. And you know, this Christmas, you've been given a precious gift. In fact, many of you um, uh, know that. It is a gift that is the perfect gift for every single season. Like the teenage version of me, though, you may not recognize how precious the gift is. It could be that you've forgotten how precious that gift is. It could be that you feel the gift isn't complete. You might think that it's not enough. You might think that the gift just isn't practical. You might not like the demands that the gift makes upon you. You know, some gifts are like that, aren't they? We buy a gift and there are demands that come with it. We buy our children a puppy because we know they're going to love that gift. And maybe some of you have done that and put it under a Christmas tree and and it's so cute as a puppy. And then we realize that that puppy makes huge demands of us in our time. Or as Minnesotans and Wisconsinians, we dream of uh, a boat and we dream about buying that boat someday and having our own boat. And many boat owners will tell you that the best days of having a boat are the day that you buy it and the day that you sell it because it's a lot of work to maintain the boat. Mike Woodley, a father of four, talks about purchasing his children a swing set about 15 years ago as an early Christmas present. And he says it was an extra long metal set with two swings, a two-seater swinging bench, a slide, monkey bars, and a series of hanging rings. And he thought the time that he invested as a father in putting together that Christmas gift would be a great way to show his children their love. And he said, besides, it was a cheap gift. It was, it was made in Germany, and he reasoned, you can't beat German engineering. And he says, well, after purchasing, hauling, dragging, and opening the 200-pound box, he was overwhelmed by the sheer number of parts and the complexity of the instructions. 
based upon the eye-popping assessment, he would have to assemble about 10,000 tiny screws, washers, nuts, and bolts, wing nuts, more washers, plastic pieces, metal bars, and metal chains. They provided an English translation of the instructions, but there were no pictures that went with it, and just convoluted technical instructions that he said you'd have to be a scientist or an engineer to understand, and he was neither. He said it was too complicated for an ordinary man like me, so with the help of some mechanically inclined friends, he managed to assemble the whole thing. But when he finished, he had a few dozen pieces left over. And he says, is there any wonder then that my 34-pound son made the entire swing set shake and wobble? We had one of those swing sets at our house, and the entire time we had it, it shook and wobbled. And I would always tell our visitors, uh, you can't be on the swings. I'll let my kids on it, but I don't want the lawsuit when, when you die on our swing. One father figured out this, that when you take a swing set like that, and if you follow the manufacturer's suggested guidelines, and you look at the swing set's life being about 20 years, it'll take you about two hours each year, according to the guidelines, to tighten the screws and the bolts and by the time the warranty was over he would have spent about two days of his life tightening the bolts that gift requires quite a bit of him it was a demanding gift and you know what some of us feel that way about christ we feel like jesus christ is a demanding gift we know that Jesus is supposed to be the greatest gift of all time. This baby that we celebrate at Christmas time is marvelous, but he is also demanding and cramps our style and we'll follow him to a point. But this whole lordship thing, well, that's a little much, some of us might say. Like, listen, Jesus' demands for you are good. Jesus' demands for you bring hope where there is hopelessness. They bring meaning to life that apart from him, if this life is all there is, this life is, is meaningless. Jesus, the prophesied Messiah, is the great hope for you and for me. You know, 600 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Isaiah wrote the following words about who Messiah would be. And he said, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish, accomplish this. Some of you think of Handel's Messiah every time you see those words. You want to jump out of your chair and begin to sing the Hallelujah Chorus. Four names are given for Messiah in Isaiah's prophecy. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And I want to take a look at that first word, that first name, Wonderful Counselor. I don't know what you think of when you hear the word Counselor. If you're like most people, you recognize that a counselor is someone that we see for their wisdom. You wouldn't go to see a counselor who you consider to be an absolute fool. There's recognition in this text that Messiah is wise. He is a wonderful counselor. Matthew Rogers writes that that word wonderful refers to the acts of God as being incomprehensible, marvelous, and miraculous. Counselor carries with it the idea of one who determines upon a plan of action and carries it out. You see, that's the, uh, the idea is that the hope for the nation of Judah was this wonderful counselor whose plans, purposes, designs, and decrees for all people would be marvelous. And I wonder today if Jesus is your wonderful counselor. Is he the first one that you go to when you need an advisor you know, great leaders throughout the history of our nation and other countries around the world have recognized how important it is to have a team of counselors or advisors around them, people who will help them. Every president of the United States has surrounded himself with a team like this. We call them the presidential cabinet. I've been reading a lot about President Abraham Lincoln lately, and he's admired by so many for the fact that he didn't surround himself as president with a bunch of yes men. In fact, there are books that have been written about the fact that he surrounded himself with a team of political rivals, people that would tell him what he needed to hear, not necessarily what he wanted to hear. This man, who knew the importance of great counsel, recognized, though, that his greatest counsel came from God, that God was his wonderful counselor. When asked if God was on the side of America, Abraham Lincoln said this, I love it, sir. My concern is not whether God is on our side. My greatest concern is to be on God's side. For God is always 
right. That's the best kind of counselor. That's wisdom. That's what we have in our God. When someone looks for a good counselor, they're looking for someone who's wise, someone who's understanding, someone who really cares. And Jesus is all of that. Job 12, 13 tells us he's wise. To God belong wisdom and power. Counsel and understanding are his. Hebrews 4.15 tells us he's understanding, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. And 1 Peter 5.7 tells us that he cares for us. Cast all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. So when we have to face any decision in our life, we know that Jesus is our best gift He's also our wonderful counselor. Jesus stands ready to advise you, to give you the direction you need. He ought to be the first person that we go to. He knows what direction is best for our life. And my question today for you is, are you listening? If, if, if you had to evaluate your life today as we move into Christmas and toward a new year, is Jesus the first one that you go to with the major decisions in your life? Is he your wonderful counselor tonight? Because it's one of the beautiful gifts that's underneath God's Christmas tree for you. Number two, Jesus is described as the mighty God. The picture here is of God as our divine mighty warrior. Kings in the ancient Near East world would go out with their men to battle. They didn't just sit on the throne and send their men out. They led the men in, into battle. The future Messiah would be a warrior king and he would be God. And that very name carried with it the expectation of incredible power. Rogers writes, many people with limited exposure to Jesus Christ see him simply as someone who's very meek and mild, somebody who's kind and gentle, someone who turned the other cheek when the soldiers beat him and made him carry his cross, and he didn't resist. And all those things are true about Jesus. But the larger picture of Christ in the Bible is that God is a mighty warrior. I talk to people all the time who don't seem to recognize this picture of God and don't seem to recognize that we live in a world where a very real spiritual battle is going on. There's a battle that goes on every single day for the souls of men and women and boys and girls. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, Paul wrote, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We need a mighty warrior, if that's the truth. To the church at Corinth, Paul wrote, For we, though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. And John prophesied in Revelation 17, 14, they will make more, war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and King of kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful ones. Listen, despite everything that hit our adversary, the devil, throws at him, Christ is our mighty warrior. And he wins. He wins in the end. The Bible is a story from beginning to end that tells the story of creation, fall, and redemption, and the hope that comes in him. From Genesis to Revelation, we see a God who is at work on behalf of his people. Christ wins. He's already triumphed over Satan, and he will continue to give us victory as we rely on him. So this Christmas, and as we move to the new year, are you struggling with temptation in your life? Do you have issues controlling your temper? Are you cheating it at home because you're giving too much time to work? Are you dealing with laziness? Are you in the clutches of an addiction? Listen, Jesus Christ is our mighty God who can deliver you from anything that the enemy or you yourself bring your way. What a beautiful promise this Christmas season. That's your God. Jesus is our mighty God. And Isaiah also tells us that he is our everlasting father. And you know what? I know there's some here today that struggle with the picture of their earthly father. They didn't have a great relationship with their dad. And so trying to understand Jesus as a heavenly father is kind of a convoluted thing. But you know, Jesus is the picture of the perfect father. And yet we don't want to confuse him with the father God. In Isaiah 9, 6, uh, that's not the picture he's giving us. Jesus isn't God the Father, but he is like a loving father who cares. There's an enduring, loving, compassionate, providing fatherly care that's offered by Messiah for his people. And when compared, combined with the word everlasting, we see a God who cares for his people today and whose kingdom will know no end. We can count on Jesus being our forever compassionate provider. 
And it was his compassion that Jesus was known for in the New Testament. Matthew tells us that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. In Matthew twenty two thirty seven, you see this parental love of Jesus. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how long, how long I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. So do you believe that Jesus cares for you? Or are you kind of like, Lord, where you been? <laughs> this has been a tough year. I I know you're supposed to care for me, but I I sure don't feel it right now. I'd I'd love to feel that. Listen, Jesus wants to take care of those needs in your life. I know this is a tough one for me. Maybe it's because I'm a a man and it's a man thing, but oftentimes I don't want to trust in the fatherly care of Jesus. I want to trust in myself to meet my needs. I want to take care of things myself. I want to take care of my family. I want to believe that I'm all that I need when it comes to protecting myself and my family. I want to give myself a whole lot more credit when things are going good in my life. And I want to give God a whole lot more blame when things are going bad in my life. And maybe I need to reverse that because it isn't an option. Jesus is our heavenly, everlasting father. There's a final title for Messiah that's given to us in Isaiah 9, 6. And that's that he's our prince of peace. In Israel, the word shalom is a common greeting. It's the Hebrew word for peace. Jesus is our prince of peace. He is our shalom. He's the one that can bring peace between the broken relationship that we have in our lives because sin has created it between man and God. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 5.1, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I wonder, do you have peace with God today? This Christmas time, can you say that he who came to bring peace to the world is someone that you've experienced peace with? In this midst of this crazy, chaotic life that we live, sometimes peace is the last thing that we experience. My wife was listening to the radio this past week, and Christmas is supposed to be this time that brings families together in love and joy and peace and happiness, but oftentimes Christmas is one of the most stressful times of the year. It's like this big ball of Black Friday mob stress descends upon us. And we miss the real meaning of the season. And we miss the peace that Christ wants to give to us. Apart from God, life makes no sense. You were created by him to have fellowship with him. And try to live your life apart from him and you won't experience peace. You're going to be miserable. When Jesus arrived on planet earth, the angels rejoiced. Luke 2.14 says that uh, they told a group of shepherds, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace. to to men on whom his favor rests. Jesus came to bring peace. What are you struggling with today? Where do you need Jesus to bring peace into your life? What do you need to invite him to do in you this Christmas season? You know, Luke 2.11 gives another name for Jesus. And it's one that I love. It's the name Savior. It's really the meaning of why he came into the world to begin with. Speaking to that same group of shepherds, the angel says, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. Is Jesus your Savior today? If not, why not now trust him with your life? Why not today say, Jesus, you know what? You've given me so much under the Christmas tree from God. And today under your Christmas tree, God, I want to give you me. I want to give you my life. When I was in college, a guest speaker came to our school, and he preached about who Jesus was. And he talked about the fact that uh, Jesus was the greatest gift the world had ever received, but he was so much more. He talked about the fact that he's a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, that he's our Savior, that he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but that he's so much more. And I recently found the text because I will never forget when this African-American pastor came to our school and preached this sermon about who God was and who Jesus reveals himself to be from Genesis to Revelation. And I want to close my portion of this service time with the quote from this pastor. He said, if you want to know what God looks like, take a good look at Jesus. Jesus Christ shines through the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation He is the answer to humanity's problems. He is the full revelation of the creator. And you see his pages 
his, 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 his face on every page of Scripture. He says in Genesis, he was the seed of the woman. In the book of Exodus, he was the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he was the high priest. And in Numbers, he was the smitten rock. In Deuteronomy, he is the prophet. In Joshua, he is the captain of the Lord of hosts. In Judges, he is the great and the final judge. In Ruth, he is the heavenly kinsman. In Samuel, he's the anointed one. In the book of Kings, he is king of kings and lord of lords. In Chronicles, he is the glory of the Lord in the temple. In Ezra, he's the teacher who comes from God. In Nehemiah, he is the one who rebuilds broken lives. And in Esther, he is the protector of the people. In Job, he is the only comforter, the only comforter to his people in times of trouble. In the book of Psalms, he is the great shepherd. In the book of Proverbs, he is the wisdom of God. In Ecclesiastes, he is the preacher of the kingdom of God. In the Song of Solomon, he is the bridegroom who is going to return for his bride, the church. In Isaiah, he is the wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, the prince of peace. And in Jeremiah, he's the potter that shapes the clay into the image of the father. In Lamentations, he is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the wheel in the middle of the wheel. In Daniel, he's the son of man who's coming on the clouds, and he's all also the fourth member of the fiery furnace. In Hosea, he is the love of God for the backslider, and I'm so happy about that. In Joel, he is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In Amos, he is the author of judgment, and he is also the author of mercy. In Obadiah, Jesus is the God of vengeance. In Jonah, he is the salvation of the Lord. In Micah, he is the great intercessor. In the book of Nahum, he is the stronghold in the day of trouble. In Habakkuk, he is the God of mercy. In Zephaniah, Jesus is the establisher of the kingdom of God upon the earth. In Haggai, he is the desire of all nations. In Zechariah, he is the branch of Joseph, or he is Jehovah. And in Malachi, he is the refiner's fire, the son of righteousness, who will ride on the clouds with healings in his wings. And that's just in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, in the book of Matthew, he's the kingly Messiah. In the book of Mark, he's the miracle worker. In the book of Luke, he's the great physician. In the book of John, he is the lamb who taketh away the sins of the world. In the book of Acts, he's the risen the Lord. In the book of Romans, he is our justification. In Corinthians, he is our purification and our sanctification. In Galatians, he's our liberation. In Ephesians, he's our perfection. In Philippians, Jesus is our joy. In Colossians, he is the head of his body, the church. In Thessalonians, he is the coming Lord. And in Timothy, he's the judge of all men. In Titus, he is the redeemer of the world. In Philemon, he is the friend who sticks closer than a brother. In Hebrews, he's the author and finisher of our faith. In James, he is the healer of the nations. In Peter, he is the chief shepherd and the bishop of our souls. In John, he is the word of God. In Jude, he is coming with ten thousands of his saints to judge the earth. And in Revelation, he is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, the lamb of God, the word of God, king of kings, and lord of lords. That's our Jesus. That's the gift that has been sent to you at Christmas time. And that ought to throw us Because those are just some of the words that are described about Jesus in each one of those books. This year as a church, we're going to take an adventure in 2012 through the entire Bible as a a congregation. And you're going to see Jesus over and over again from Old Testament to New Testament. That's our God. It's the gift that was given to us at Christmas. And if you haven't trusted him, you're missing out on the purpose to life. And so I want to close this portion of our time together on Christmas with an invitation for you to accept the gift that God is holding there. And he's saying, please, please take what I've given to you. And so many of us have so stubbornly said, nope, don't want it. I'm going to I'm fine on my own. And today's the day to quit being so stubborn. Today's the day to say, Jesus, I accept you. I believe that you are who you said that you were. In Romans 10, 9, Paul told a church at Rome that if they will confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, and lordship means there's some demands. He gets to take control. If they will confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, and they will believe in their hearts that God has raised him from the dead, an event that was witnessed by more people than so many of the events that we count as history here in our nation, then you'll be saved. So I want to invite you to do that today if you've never done this. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you that you love me. 
Thank you that you proved your love for me and that you sent your one and only son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life and to die on a cross on my behalf. And God, forgive me for so many years having heard about this gift and having had your spirit speak to me and knowing that you stand there with a gift ready for me to accept that stubbornly I've walked by that gift over and over again. Maybe because of my own willful disobedience and not wanting to yield my life to you. Maybe because there's just some questions that I naturally have as a skeptic. Maybe because I'm afraid of the demands. Maybe because I've just really enjoyed this life of sin. But today I, I find myself in a spot where what I used to enjoy, I find, has brought me pain. And it's brought long time hurt. And Jesus, today, I tell you, I don't want to be a person that ignores the greatest gift that was ever given to the world, you, anymore. Jesus, you were born in a manger, but you were born in the shadow of a cross. I recognize that my sin has separated me from God. And today, Jesus, I ask you to forgive my sins. Today, I ask you to take control of my life as Lord. Because, God, I can't do that on my own. I needed your perfect son. And Lord, forgive me for doubting you. Forgive me for thinking that there are so many different ways to get to you when, Lord, if that were true, the most selfish thing in the world would have been for God to send his only son into the world, to die the most horrific and vicious death imaginable, and then say, ha, just kidding, everyone gets in. Jesus, what you went through on the cross for me was awful. And I want to thank you, but I want to stop running. And this Christmas Eve, I give myself to you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer this Christmas Eve, share it with somebody. It's the greatest news. If uh, you came here with somebody and you shared that news and you know they're walking with Christ, I know that this Christmas Eve, they'd love to hear that from you. And uh, 